Good morning. As Jeff said, my name's Micah, and I'm not one of the pastors here, but every once in a while they ask me to come up here. We're still not sure why that is, but they keep asking, so I keep coming up here. Um, but I wasn't always just a, uh, a lowly realtor locally. I also was in full-time ministry at one part of my life. When I graduated college, I went to work with a, a group that was doing ministry to college students around the country through the uh, National uh, Prayer Breakfast group. And the first assignment they gave me was they sent me to Kansas, and they sent me to a bunch of different people and friends there, and they had me spend time with them, get to know them, and, and those folks were to challenge me, disciple me, and, and give me some things to think about as I entered this ministry with uh, college kids. Now, uh, I don't like to travel at all. I really like being home. I don't like getting out of my comfort zone. I don't especially like traveling by myself. Um, and so this was not an exciting assignment that they gave me. Actually, I was a little concerned about it and nervous about it and didn't really want to do it. And a friend challenged me and said, no, you go, it'll, it'll be good. Um, you know, I'm sure there'll be some things for you to, to learn and grow from and it'll be a fun experience. And the people you're gonna be with are awesome. So I went and uh, one night, I'm hanging out with these guys in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, young guys like myself, maybe a couple years older than me, and we're just sort of sitting around hanging out. We've just been sitting in the pool or whatever. And we were like, what are we going to do tonight? And one of the guys that was hosting us goes, well, there's an Allison Krauss concert down the road. Some of you have heard this story. And they said, there's an Allison Krauss concert down the, down the road. Let's go. And the other two guys, me and one other that were there, said, you know, well, we, we don't have tickets. And they, the guy goes, well, that's not, that's not important. Let's just go. We're going to we'll get in. We're like, oh, okay, we're, we're up for it. Let's, let's have an adventure. So the guy that was hosting us put on a, like a suit. He got all like dressed up and looked official. And we went over to this big arena. And we walked in the front door and there's like security and stuff. And then the ticket, people taking the tickets are there. And we walked through security. They checked us or whatever. And then we go up to the ticket counter and they go, tickets. And my buddy who's there in the suit goes, hey, um, I need to get these guys in the concert now. And they go, and who are you? And they sa he said, oh, I'm the guy that's supposed to get them in. And who are they? Well, they're the people that I have to get in the concert. <laughs> and the lady was like, no, okay, nice try, fellas. And she goes, security. <laughs> so the head security guard walks over and he goes, what's going on, fellas? And he goes, we got to get them in the concert. Like, this is very important. And he was like, but you don't have tickets, right? And we were like, well, no, that's not important. We just have to get in there now. And he goes, fellas, go. You got to get out of here. This isn't going to happen. You just need to leave. We're like, you sure? There's nothing we can do to get in this concert? He's like, no, get out of here. So we're like, okay, fine. So we leave. And as we start walking to the cars, our buddy, the Tosin, is like, we're not leaving. We're going to the concert. We're like, well, okay, I don't know how that's going to happen. But he's like, let's just walk around the arena and see what happens. We're like, okay. So we start walking around, like checking doors and stuff. Like we have no idea what we're doing. So we finally see like this, there's this like driveway underneath the arena. And it's like cars going down there and stuff. And so we're like, yeah, let's go down there. So we walk down underneath the arena and there's the buses parked for the band and like all these cars parked. And we're like, well, well we're kind of making progress, I guess. And we're like, well, what do we do now? So we'll just check doors. So we started checking doors. And finally, we found a door was open to this like concrete stairwell. And we're like, wow, this is, this is our ticket in. This is great. So we check every, every floor and all of the doors are locked. So we're stuck in this concrete stairwell. And all of a sudden, we're standing at the doors and we're about to give up. And the door behind us opens. And we're like, whoop grab the door as it's about to close, and we just sort of like, okay, here we go. We walk in, and literally the stage is here where the band is playing. We're here. <laughs> we're standing next to the stage because we walked in this door, and we're just like, what is, what is going on? This is awesome. There's Allison Krauss and her band, and they're performing, and it's so cool, and there's this one other young lady that's standing right next to us. So we watch the concert. We're hanging out on the stage. We see out and all these people are out in the audience, but not us. We're on the stage. So we're hanging out. We watch Allison, you know, do a few songs. And then the concert ends. And we look over at this young lady and she goes, hey, guys. And we're like, hey, how you doing? She's like, good. She's like, what are you guys doing? We're like, we're just watching the concert. She's like, oh, uh, I'm with the band. You guys want to go hang out? We're like, yeah, sure. She's like, come on, let's go. So we're like, okay. 
So we walk across the stage, go back into this back room, and she walks us right in and sits us down with Alison Krauss and her entire band. So now we're sitting there talking to her, talking to Alison Krauss and hanging out, and we're like, this is the craziest thing ever. How did we get here? Like, this is insane. And we're just hanging out, and all of a sudden I look over and, and past the open door, the, the head security guard goes like this. And we're like, uh-oh. <laughs> so we get up, we sort of walk over, and uh, we're like, yeah? And he goes, I knew you guys were going to get in. <laughs> so it was a crazy night. We had a lot of fun. Now, why would I tell you that story? Two reasons. One, because it's fun. And I don't have a ton of fun stories, but that was a good one. But also, that trip actually was such a pivotal moment in my understanding of the presence of Jesus. I did not want to go to this week or two weeks in Kansas by myself. I like really didn't want to go. And this friend that encouraged me to go said, hey, why don't you, when you go, why don't you just invite Jesus to go with you? Like when you sit in the plane, like act like he's sitting next to you. Now my whole life, I had sort of wrestled, like I, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, I think he loves me, but I really wrestled with, does he really love me? Like does he really want to be with, like why me? What's so special about me? I kind of looked at it like this concert that we were trying to get into. Like Jesus was locked in some back room and there was no access to him. Only for certain special people that had like the right ticket could get in and get into the presence of God. Not me. The doors were all locked to me. And even if I did get in, why would he want to spend time with me? I didn't, you know, think that I was really worthy or that he would really want to be with me. So this is something I had wrestled with. So this was sort of a revelation to me like, act like Jesus is coming with me. Like, that's sort of an interesting thought. And, and that was a very powerful experience for me that week that I was there because I actually, like, tried that. I practiced that and had this great experience with the Lord. But I'm not alone in that struggle of feeling like, am I, does God really want to be with me? And, and do I have access to him like that? Like, maybe you struggle with that too. Matter of fact, the early Jewish friends, they, had, they knew that reality. That was real to them. God only lived in this one little room in the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And there was no access to anyone except for the high priest once a year. The high priest could go in, make an offering to God, and then atone for his sins and the sins of the people, and then leave. Once a year. That was the access they had to God the Father. So they knew the reality of that. So it's not like unique to me that I struggle with this. Matter of fact, there was this veil, there was this curtain that's, that sort of separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the tabernacle. So this curtain separated the people from God, from an intimate relationship with him. And then Jesus came. And he changed completely their understanding the people's understanding of who God is and their access to God. I want to look at one thing. Jesus started talking about God as his father in heaven. This was like, this was revolutionary. But more than that, it was dangerous and scary to the religious leaders. It was blasphemous, so much so that they, when Jesus started talking like this, they started planning to kill him. Because they, God is not that. He's off in the holy of holies. Like there's, there's separation. God can't be with us sinners. But Jesus talked about this intimate relationship he had with this God in heaven. And it scared the religious people. And it blew the minds of all the people following Jesus. Matter of fact, he taught them how to pray by saying this in Matthew 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because there are many words. Do not be like them. For your father, not only Jesus' father, your father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our father who art in heaven. Our father. Not only was he Jesus' father, but he's our father. 
called him Abba, this intimate expression of a child with their father, and changed completely their understanding of who God was. Brennan Manning, um, who's a famous teacher, is no longer with us, has an incredible message that he gave years and years ago called the, the Abba Experience. And I would encourage you to listen to that. That's something that I try to listen to at least once a year because it, it helps reshape my understanding of who God is. And he talks about how this father loves us like his little children. And we have access to him as though he's our father in heaven. This, Brennan says, is the revolutionary revelation of Jesus Christ. That this heavenly father, this God that was once unknowable, unapproachable, unattainable, distant being is now close and intimate and we can have a personal and deep relationship with him like a child and their father. The revolutionary revelation of Jesus. And Jesus taught his followers all about the father. As a matter of fact, in John 17, it says this, Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's in the garden and he says this, he prays for his disciples by saying, I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they've obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you've given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. That's one of the things that Jesus came to do. Yes, he came to go to the cross. But he also came to reveal God, the Father, to his people. He taught them all about God, who he was, what he was like, in many different ways. But Jesus wasn't just the teacher about God. He wasn't there just to tell them what God was like. Jesus is God. And he demonstrates to us the way this heavenly Father feels about you and about me the way he relates to us, the way we can have access to him and be in relationship with him. Colossians 1.15 says this, Now Christ is the visible expression of the invisible God. John 1.18, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, Jesus, who is himself God as in, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Jesus is God and demonstrates this heavenly Father's love for us in the way that he relates to people, the way that he relates to us. So if you look throughout the scriptures and you see the way Jesus interacts with people, that's a little taste of the way the Father feels about you and about me and the way he wants to be in relationship with us. So I challenge you, go look in the, in the Gospels and see how Jesus relates to people. I've done that. And every experience that Jesus has with someone else, it doesn't matter who they are or what walk of life they come from, what their background is, doesn't matter what their religion is, what their race is, where they come from, none of it mattered. Jesus treated them all as brothers and sisters of his heavenly father. Religious leaders, the righteous, he welcomed them. Sinners, he welcomed them. People that need, in need of healing, the downtrodden, the people that need help, he welcomed them. There are so many stories in the, in the Gospels where a blind man is lying on the road and hears Jesus is walking by and starts going, Jesus, son of man, have mercy on me. And Jesus' disciples start going, hey, shh, he's teaching right now. And he starts yelling even louder, Jesus, son of man, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, bring him to me. That's the welcome Jesus has. It doesn't matter what their motives are, why they're coming to Jesus, what they want from him. He welcomes them with open arms and engages with them in a personal and intimate relationship and starts a friendship. The early disciples, think about the way they came to Jesus at first. Philip comes to Jesus. John the Baptist says, oh, behold, the Lamb of God. And Philip turns and follows with a friend of his. And Jesus sees them following, turns around and goes, what do you want? They go, uh, where are you staying? That's the question they have for this savior of the world that they've been taught about and told about. They, in, they encounter him and they say, where are you staying? That's all they have. What does Jesus say? 
Come and see. Come with me. Let's go. The early disciples are in a boat with Jesus, and he says, come, follow me, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. Matter of fact, in Mark, there's a story of the little children. These, these parents are bringing these little children to Jesus. They just want to get them to Jesus. And the disciples say, don't bother him now, not now. And Jesus gets furious with them. He says, let the children come to me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he grabs the little children and he blesses them. This is the kind of welcome that Jesus and our Father in heaven has for each one of us. And we act like he, they don't want to be with us. Why would they want to be with me? And yet, every experience Jesus has throughout the whole of Scripture, when he interacts with someone, he welcomes them in. No matter why they come. I want to look at one story found in Mark chapter 10. You guys may have heard this story before. It's, it's called, we've titled it, The Rich Young Ruler. And I think this tells us a lot about how we can interact with Jesus. Mark 10, starting in verse 17, it says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this young man has got it together. Okay? He's young. He's wealthy. He has power. He's asking a good question. He's identified Jesus as someone that's worth going and pursuing and asking a question of. So he goes and he rushes. He's eager to meet with Jesus. He runs after him. And when he gets to him, he falls on his knees. He takes the right posture in front of Jesus. And he's, he asks him a great question, a question that I think most of us in this room, if we're honest, have asked ourselves. How can we inherit eternal life? Like, what happens when we die? I don't want that just to be it. Like, if there is this heaven that I've been told about, and God is there, and Jesus is there, how do I get there? So the young man asks a good question. Jesus says this, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now some people will say this is Jesus denying his divinity. I think it's the exact opposite. I think this is Jesus revealing himself to this young man. I think he knows this young man is sharp. The young man has probably heard of Jesus numerous times, maybe even sat and listened to him talk before. Just like us, we've all had some sort of experience with this person, Jesus, right? Maybe it's in Sunday school. Maybe it's a friend told us about him one night. Maybe we go to church regularly. Whatever it is, we've had some interaction with Jesus, and this man has had enough interaction with Jesus to know that he's something more than just a teacher. He's a good teacher. So he goes and calls him good. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one's good except for God. I think Jesus is giving him a little hint. Yeah, there's something different about me. And I'm going to let you see just a little taste of that. I think he's revealing himself to this young man. And this is, this is what Jesus continues by saying, You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and, father and mother. And the young man says, teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. A few weeks ago, we talked about how we each sort of walk around with this cardboard cut, of, cut out of ourselves. It's the person we want everyone else to see. It's not the real us. It's just the us, the version of us that we hope other people think of us when they, when they think of us. That I want them to see that. It's the social media person, right? All the good things, none of the bad. So this young man says to Jesus, I've kept all those commandments since I was a boy. Now, I don't think he's lying to Jesus. I just don't think he knows himself very well. Matter of fact, I think if you asked his friends or his family, hey, has he kept all these? They'd all be like, <laughs> yeah, no, not even one day. But it doesn't matter necessarily to Jesus what this young man thinks of himself. Just like it doesn't matter to Jesus and, and our Heavenly Father what I think of myself. It doesn't matter whether I think I'm worthy of God spending time with me or wanting to be with me or wanting to know me. That has no impact on whether God actually loves me and want to, wants to be with me. 
Just like your perception of yourself has nothing to do with the way he loves you. What an amazing gift that is. Because if his love for us was dependent on the way we saw ourselves, a lot of us would be in trouble. In one of two ways. We think way too little of ourselves, that we're not worthy, or we think way too highly of ourselves and think, I don't need him. But that doesn't matter to Jesus. As a matter of fact, when this young man says, I've kept all these commandments, this is what it says, verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. What a gift that is, that l- tiny little verse. Regardless of our perception of ourselves, the way that we don't really know who we are, regardless of that, and regardless of our understanding of who Jesus is, he loves us anyways. And he loves you as well. Doesn't matter how you see yourself, it's how he sees you. And Jesus continues by saying, one thing you lack, young man, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now, if money has never been your real problem, don't tune out right now. Because it doesn't matter what is keeping this young man from this invitation Jesus has just given him to come and follow him. This young man, his wealth, his possessions were an issue. Here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't say to the young man, he doesn't get in like a theological discussion and argument with him and going, actually, son, you haven't kept all those commandments. Let me tell you why you haven't kept those commandments. He doesn't get into that. What does Jesus care about? The young man's heart. That's what he's working on. That's what he's addressing. So he says, okay, okay, I'll give you that. One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, then come follow me. What an amazing invitation this young man's just been given. He's just been asked to follow and walk side by side with this person, Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. How does he respond? At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. I think it's fascinating that the young man isn't angry. He's not disappointed. He's not saying, that's not fair. I want to follow you. I want to turn, I want, I want to be with you forever. But I have a lot of things, Jesus, you don't understand. Like it took me a long time to accumulate those things. Not only that, at this time, the people in this day related wealth with blessing. So his whole life, he's probably thinking, how blessed am I? I have all this stuff. God has been so good to me. But he's not angry at Jesus. He's sad. Because I think he realizes, I want to be with you. I want to follow you. I want to have this close, intimate relationship with you. But this stuff is just too hard to give up. I think he also is sad because I think he knows in his heart of hearts that he's making the wrong decision. That's why he's sad. So here's my question for you. What is it in your life and in your heart that's keeping you from Jesus? It might be money. It might be hurt feelings or a broken relationship. It might be pride. It might be disappointment with your circumstances. There's all sorts of, I mean, I could sit up here for hours and talk about reasons and things that could be keeping you from a close and intimate relationship with Jesus. But we all have something. Maybe it's something we continually battle. Maybe it's something that changes every day. But we always have something that's battling for our heart and keeping us from this close, intimate relationship with Jesus. So here's my encouragement to you. Don't trade these temporary things that are not going to last, that are ultimately worthless, for the greatest gift and invitation you've ever been given. 
a relationship with this Jesus and his Father in heaven. Remember, it doesn't matter what you think of yourself, it's what they think of you. Do you believe, could you believe today that he loves you like he loves that young man or those children that come to him or his disciples or all the many, many people that Jesus interacted with that he loved so well and showed the way that our heavenly father loves them? Do you believe, do you dare to believe today that he loves you like that? I struggle with that every day. Every day. But I'm struggling through it. I'm fighting through it. And one of the ways we do that is we answer the invitation he's given us. Come, follow me. We still to this day, and maybe even more than ever before in the history of the world, have access to Jesus and his Father in heaven. When we say a simple yes to Jesus, he gives us his spirit, and we have even greater access to him. So does he potentially love you like that? Does he want to be in relationship with you? I want to end with one passage. It's found in Matthew 27. And I I don't want you to read it. I just want you to sit and listen. And maybe this will be your uh, reassurance as you leave here today. One of the challenges I want to leave you with is I, I... I would encourage you, as you go this week, every day, whether it's one minute or five minutes or five hours, just take one minute and go, like this young man did, run to Jesus and drop on your knees in front of him and say, would you really want to be in relationship with me? Would you go with me today? What do you think of me, Lord? Did you really come for me? I think you will be shocked if you do this regularly. I think you will be so floored by the answer you hear. Side note, I wasn't planning to share this, but I just thought of it. I have to do it. So a good buddy of mine, I I love golf, okay? And a good buddy of mine just called me a couple weeks ago, and he said, Micah, I got a hole in one. And I was so excited for him. I called him immediately. Well, he texted me, and then I called him immediately. I was like, tell me the whole story. I want to know everything. So he went through the whole story, and he goes, you know what's funny? He's like, I took my, young, my sons out, we were playing golf, and he's like, every time we go play golf, it's all about them, like I'm helping them. And he said, on the first hole, I walked off the green, and I just said a little prayer. I said, Lord, could you maybe just make this fun for me today? I know it's usually about the kids, but I just, I want, it, I want this to be fun. A number of holes later, he gets a hole in one. And he doesn't remember that prayer until like a number of holes after the hole in one. He celebrates with his sons and they have a good time. And then when the whole excitement dies down a little bit, he's walking down the the course and he hears a little whisper in his heart. How fun was that? Here's the lesson from that. It's not all about eternity and these deep, heavy, difficult things that we're wrestling with every day. Sometimes it's just about, hey God, can you just... Be with me today. Can I just have a little fun on the golf course? How much fun was that? I asked him after that, I said, what what are you going to take away from this day? Which is more valuable to you? That hole in one or that little whisper in your heart that God said to you? And he goes, no questions asked. It's not even close. The little whisper. Because that's the Lord showing me I love you. I'm engaged with you right now today. That's how I feel about you. So let's end with this. You all have heard about Jesus and the fact that ultimately he goes to the cross. Well, let me just say, this is the greatest demonstration of the Father's love for us. Let this be your encouragement as you leave today. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. (laughs) About three in the afternoon... Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Ali, Ali, Lama Sabachthani. 
which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. That's a miracle of God. Symbolizing the death of Jesus for us. Cut that curtain that kept the people from God said that's not the way it is any longer now you have access to your heavenly father that's how much he loves you and he loves me don't question today whether he wants to be with you because he can't prove it any more than that let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you that you sent your Son so that we would know about you and that we could be in relationship with you, Lord. Lord, thank you that regardless of how we feel about ourselves today and how we think of you, you love us and want to be with us. As we go from here, Lord, we ask that you would go with us. Lord, whether we've known you for many, many years or maybe today, for the first time we're going to experience you, we ask that you'd be with us. Help us to know and to trust and to believe your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus is waiting, God so 